So the year is 1982 and you decide you want one of these newfangled personal computer things. And you decide to get the best of the best, the latest and the greatest. That being the Commodore 64. 64K of memory. Ooh yeah. See. Take it home and take it out of the box. Hook it up to your TV. And don't forget to plug in the power too. You turn on your TV and set it to channel 3. And then you power on the 64. And stand there in awe as a blue screen emerges from the static. You try typing something, but no matter what you type, you just get a syntax error. And now only one question remains. Now what? Well, basics what? Okay, so in case you're not familiar, here's an extremely brief history lesson. BASIC was originally created in 1964 at Dartmouth College, but it's probably most well known for being included in many early personal computers, and it was very popular in the early days of home computers. And basically all early computers had BASIC built into ROM, and that's what you and you'd entered into the BASIC console when you power it on. Oh, and one final thing before I start. I should mention that I will be using a Commodore 64 for the demonstration in today's video, but most of the things I'm going to be showing will work on really any version of BASIC out there. For the things that are specific to the Commodore 64, I'll be sure to uh, point that out. Okay, so here we are at the BASIC prompt, and BASIC is an interpreted language, and we're basically in the console right now. So we can actually just type out single lines of code without actually entering into a program and have it executed. So we'll go like print. World, and it'll just do that single line. You might notice that the blue on blue on the Commodore 64 here is not very easy to read, so we can change it to something like white by hitting Control 2. Now all new text we type is going to be white. To enter into a multi-line program, we have to enter a line number. So we always go up by 10, so I'll show you why we do that in a sec. But we'll go 10, then we're going to 20, go to 10, which will just basically be like an infinite loop run to start the program and there we go it's like an infinite loop you can stop by hitting run stop although the key to stop the program can be different on different computers and to list it we can just list which will display the program to us the reason we go up by tens is so that we can insert a line in between lines so we can go for example 15 this is line 15 and when we list it that line is asserted between the two lines. That's just the way these old editors work. You can't really like go up and insert a line. You have to like use the line numbers to tell it what order you want the lines to be in. So now we run it. There we go. To clear our program from memory, we just type new. As you can see, our program's gone now. We can do things like set variables by just, by just giving a variable name. Let's give it a value, so we'll go x equals 3, y equals 5, and then we can go something like print 3 times 5, it gives us 15. And I'll give you a little bit of variables. If you just have like a variable name with nothing after it, it's basically a floating point variable. If we add a dollar sign, that means it's a string variable, or we can store text in it. And if we have a percent sign, that's basically an integer variable, or basically a number with nothing after the decimal point. The reason why we sometimes want to use integers is because integer math is faster. So the next thing I want to talk about is loops. Loops are used a lot in programming, and they're pretty important. So here's how we do loops in BASIC. So we're going to go 10, 4, x equals 0 to 10. 20 print x and then 30 next x so what line 30 does like next x it basically tells us to increment x and go back to 10 and basically it'll loop the code in between 10 and 30 so in between the 4 and the next whatever code is in between that will be executed and 20 will just print out the value of x and there you go it loops through all the values of x and prints them out each time it goes through the loop and the value of x is incremented each time. List individual lines of code by just typing list and then a line number. And uh, let's change this to 20, and then we're gonna use the step function. So we're gonna, for x equals one to 20, step three, which will increment it by three each time. 
now let's run it. As you can see, it now goes up by threes. 10, two, zero, step negative one, and that's how we can make a loop that decrements. So we can run that, and it goes 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. So that's how we decrement in the loop. So that's uh, some basic loops in BASIC. So next I'm going to show you how to get user input in BASIC. There is a function called input, so we're going to go 10, input, and we can give a prompt. So enter your name, semicolon, and then a variable we want to store the value that the user will input. So we're going to go n dollar sign. The dollar sign basically says that's a string variable. We're going to call it n for name. 20 print hello and then the name variable and we do have to put the dollar sign after the variable name every single time we use this variable this basic is not dynamically type static type language so you have to tell it what type of variable the variable is run that six there we go. We can also go something like 10 input x, 20 input y, 30 print x plus y. Run that. 10 to 12. Like that. So you can input both text and numbers using the input function. Next up is if statements. So we're going to 10, input, enter the number 12, store that in x. So for line 20, we're going to go if x equals 12, then print good job, and then colon end, which will end the program. But if it's not equal 20, it'll go on to line 30, and we'll do print. For line 30, we'll go, why didn't you do what I told you to do? So run that, we'll enter the number 12. 12, good job. Run, enter the number 12. I don't know, let's enter 3. Why didn't you do what I told you to do? So that's a basic if statement. So we can also do uh, less than, greater than. So change it here. So we're going to go 10, enter a number over 10. For 20, we're going to go if x is greater than 10, then print good job. So here it is with a greater than, less than. Number 10, number over 10, 11, good job. Enter number over 10, we'll put 9. So anyway, here's a little program I wrote. It just makes the ball bounce on the screen. And I figured I'd write a program that's a bit more interesting than some of the other bland examples I showed earlier. And uh, right now I want to talk about subroutines. So let's break out of this program and list it. And I'll walk you through it here. So for line 10, we're going to go for x equals 0 to 39, since there's 40 columns of text on the screen, and we can't quite go to 40, and then we're going to go go sub 100, or go to subroutine at line 100, and our subroutine at line 100 is going to print character string 147, which is a control character to clear the screen, so line 100 will clear the screen, then 110 will go print tab and then the value of x and then a ball and what the tab does is basically like an indent so it will for example we can go print and it will basically create an indent of whatever value you put in so we're going to put create an indent with the value of x and then we're going to print this ball character and then 120 we're going to go return which will return from the subroutine and continue on back to line 30 which will go next x That'll increment x as the ball goes across the screen from left to right. At 40, we're going to go for x equals 39 to 0, step negative 1, go sub 100, next x, and then let's all the way back at the far left again. We're going to go to 10, which will start the whole program over again. Run that. It makes the ball bounce. Yay. So the next thing I want to talk about is peak and poke. What peak and poke allows you to do is basically directly modify specific areas in memory. 
even though the peek and poke commands are fairly universal across all basics on all the different computers from back in the day, the actual memory addresses can be quite a bit different from one computer to another. So the pokes that I'm showing here are for the Commodore 64. It will really only work on the Commodore 64. So anyway, for example, we can go poke 53280, three, change the color of the border to like a cyan. Two, which will change the border to red. Two, eight, one, comma, zero, which will change the background to black. The poke command allows you to modify it anywhere in memory. So you can go poke one, zero, two, four, comma, one, which will put an A in the top corner of the screen. Comma, two, which will put a B, comma, six, which will put a Z. And we can read that location in memory using the peak command. So we can go print peak 24, which will read that location in the top corner of the screen memory. So here's that little ball program again. And let's add some pokes and peaks to make it a little bit more interesting. So here it is, I added some stuff to it. So after line 30, I added a 35, which is go sub to 200. So once it makes it all the way to the far right, it goes to 35, which will go go sub 200. And then same thing with the far left. And then at 200, we're gonna poke 53280, which is the memory location that controls the border color. And we're gonna read that value and we're gonna add one to it. And then 210, we're gonna return from the subroutine. Now run this. I probably didn't spell return right. I always seem to make that typo. I can never spell return right. Okay, let's try this again. There we go. So every time it hits the sides, it increments the border color register. I should also mention that when using the poke command, not poke a memory location with a value higher than 255. So if we try to run we'll poke 53280, 256, that gives us an illegal quantity error because the highest we can poke into there is 255. Okay, so let's save our program. First, I'm going to show you how to save it to cassettes. We need to have our data set hooked up. Save and then we can give it a file name, but we don't have to. We're just going to call it ball. And I'll say press record and play on tape. And the screen will go blank. And this can take a minute to save. The tape is pretty slow. One eternity later. And there we go, it is now saved. Now let's reset the machine. You can just type load to load a program from tape. Say press play on tape. The screen will go blank. And it takes a while to load. One eternity later. And then it says found ball. And the screen goes blank again. And just wait, don't do anything. And now we have loaded the program. And now if we list it, our program is right there. So now let's save it to disk. So I have a disk drive hooked up to device eight. And we're just gonna go save. And we're gonna give it a name. We're gonna call it ball two, since I already have a program on that disk called ball. And we're just gonna go comma eight, which will tell it to save it to device number eight. And then it says saving. And there we go. And to load it, we go load ball two comma eight. We get a directory, which we do by loading a program called dollar sign, which is kind of weird. So we're going to load dollar sign comma eight, which should give us a directory showing us what's on the disk. And then we can list that. And there we go. We've got our ball two and this ball program I saved earlier on our disk. Okay, so finally to end off this video, I want to show you a few interesting things that are specific to Commodore Basic. 
So the first one is we can actually incorporate keystrokes into our print statements. So let me show you. Print, and then we can go like shift clear home, which will clear the screen. It'll be represented as a inverted heart, but it clears the screen. Then we cursor down four spaces, cursor right like five spaces, change the text color to green, type something, and then like cursor down like two more spaces, and to the left two spaces, hit control one, which will change the color to black, control nine to turn on reverse mode, hello, like that. So we got a bunch of keystrokes, and then we hit enter. And there we go. Something else we can do is abbreviate commands. So we can actually abbreviate print with a question mark. Print. Hello. And there we go. Other commands can be abbreviated, such as list. So instead of typing L-I-S-T, although I don't actually have a program in memory, you can type L and then shift I, which will show this little quarter circle symbol and that will be the same as list unfortunately I don't have a program in memory anyway now we can abbreviate poke by p and then shift o same with peak p shift e four which is f shift o go to which is g shift o run which is r shift u you get the idea so a lot of the commands do have abbreviations like that so anyway, that's just about it for today's video. I hope you found it interesting and maybe learned something. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for watching and have a great day.